But uh, last last Sunday um, was a really awesome and special Sunday for me and my family, um, personally. And, and that's really that's really uh, what allowed um, what made me wrestle with what to teach this Sunday. And so um, this morning we're going to be headed into Second Timothy verse chapter one verses one through twelve. And the title of the message this morning is going to be The Fellowship of Suffering. Ironically, um, one of my mentors, one, a guy who's poured into me from, from, I met him at Bible college. He was one of our teachers. Um, he, he sent me a text like, hey, dude, I, I, heard you, uh, I heard you got ordained. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh, really awesome. Welcome to the Fellowship of Suffering. And I was like, huh? Like, what do you mean? You know, and that's really what, uh, what what that using what God has been doing in the youth ministry with your guys as junior hires and high schoolers, um, and how God just allowed a, a special uh, time for my family and I uh, to take place last Sunday. I really wanted to drive home the message that suffering and for the name of Christ isn't just for the person teaching the word, but it's for the believer who says, "God, I'm going to follow you." And so uh, it's going to bring us here into uh, where we find Paul now in prison for the, se- uh, for the last time in Rome. But the difference from previous times to now is that Paul is, is in a prison that, that's, uh, that's dark, that's damp, and, and it's a dungeon. It's not, it's not house arrest. It's not in the luxury of a home, but it's in the, in the shadows of, of darkness underneath uh, like a Roman prison. Um, and again, the title is Fellowshipping in the Suffering of Christ. And the, the, the pivotal point about this letter, it's the last letter that Paul writes. It's the last letter that he writes before being beheaded and martyred for his belief, belief and faith in Christ. And so let's pray one more time. God, I thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for allowing us to get to open your word, Lord. It's, it, it, it still blows my mind, Lord, that you allow us the opportunity to say, God, I want you in my life. And you provide so many things for us to just draw close to you, God. So, Lord, I pray that as we direct the message this morning, as we, as we wrestle through Scripture, as we, as we go through what you've intended for us to go through this morning, God, that you stir our hearts, that you direct what you need to direct, God, and that you just, again, make yourself so evidently known in everyone's life in this room, God. In your powerful name, we pray. And so, and so with the title, Suffering, Fellowship of suffering, the question I'm going to repetitively ask over and over for, for the sole purpose that I want you to go home tonight and be like, dang, I do say that word a lot. And, and, because it makes you wrestle with how much are you personally willing to suffer in your fellowship with Christ. Again, to, to, to reintroduce my intro to you guys, fellowship and, and suffering isn't just for the, for the guy or the person who's standing behind a, a pulpit and teaching the word of God or in ministry. It's for any person that at one point in their life, they say, God, I want to follow you, and I desire to know you more today than I did yesterday. Let's start in chapter 1. Greetings from Paul. Verse 1 says this. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have never, I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. You see, what Paul is speaking of here in this first verse in this introduction is the eternal life that comes only when you come to the knowledge and the knowing and the relationship of who Jesus is. Friends, in, in, I have room. I have, I have good news. I have good news for you in the room if you're a believer. And, 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 and the good news is that when you die, there is no death. The good news is that there is no death. And what I mean by this is that once you die and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you seemingly and easily just move positions. The only thing that happens is your body, this flesh, just decays away, but your eternity with God is already at start from the minute that you say, God, I want you in my life. But that's only when you recognize who Jesus is. That's only when you acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior. It's, it's, it's in the last section of this first verse. He, uh, about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. You see, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
What is added on to us as a promise is eternity in the presence of God, is eternity being able to say, holy, holy, holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. That's what is promised unto us the minute that you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But what is also added to every believer is the suffering. The suffering that comes with being represented, with being correlated, with being known as a Christ believer, as a, as a person who is set apart because of their faith of who Jesus is. It's promise. It's not one or the other. And our culture teaches the little opposite. Our culture is a little different that once you accept Christ, all things are good. All things are well. No, it's the opposite. Oftentimes when you accept Christ, things sometimes get worse. But the promise that he gives us is that in those seasons of difficulty, in those seasons of hardship, in those seasons of suffering that you will endure, that you will come across in your walk with God is that he'll be right there with you. So again, in your walk with God, how much are you willing to suffer in the fellowship with Christ? How much are you willing to say, God, I want you in my life, every ounce of you, every good, every bad. I want to just live in the soul center of your will for my life. Paul knew what it meant to die to almost every area of himself. Paul knew what it meant to fellowship in the suffering of Christ from personal experience. If you don't know, just read through Acts. If you don't know, just read through most of the New Testament. This man was persecuted. This man was beaten. This man was flogged. This man was left for dead after being stoned. All for solely saying, hey, Jesus loves you. Jesus desires you. All you have to do is confess him as your Lord and Savior. Back in Acts, the first message I had a privilege of teaching here what was the radical redirection when God got a hold of Paul's life so viciously and awesome in a way that Paul remembers it. And Acts attests to the moment when when. Paul is physically, his name was Saul, but he's physically bind by, by, the, by the Lord on the road to Damascus. And the Lord comes to Ananias, another believer, and says, hey, go get Paul. Go get Paul because I have chosen him as my vessel to go and share the good news as my missionary, as a person who I'm going to use first and foremost to declare my name. But God also says there in Acts chapter 9, verse 16, don't flip there, it should be behind me. And it says, and I will show him, meaning Paul, how much he must suffer for my namesake. I, I, I like to do a little wordplay and, and changing the name. I will show him, add your name, how much you will suffer for my namesake. How much I will cause you to suffer for my namesake, says the Lord. Don't forget that, that in the seasons of wrestling, that in the seasons of suffering, that in the seasons of hardship as a believer, it is a moment to bring glory to God. It is the moment that we can use as an opportunity to say, look, this moment, it can destroy me, but instead I'm going to let God into the situation. And in that suffering, I'm going to bring glory to his name. And here, in the continuation of this section, God, God uses Paul to tell Timothy how he is to endure in the fellowship of suffering in Christ. So we might take something from this as well. Read with me in verse 2. I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. My, may God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. See, Timothy had become a spiritual son to Paul. In the journey of following Christ, Paul was invested in raising up the next generation. On his second missionary trip, Paul sees Timothy, meets Timothy for the second time, and he says, man, this is a man of God. This is a young man devoted to God. And he invites Timothy to say, hey, follow me and, and walk with me in doing God's will in your life, in my life, and declaring his name. So much so that during that time, they formed this bond of a shepherd and a sheep, of a wise man and a young man who is trying to learn and learn what God has in store for him. 
I think it's so beautiful when a church is so invested in the next generation, when God is so invested in raising up the next person. The truth is that oftentimes in our culture, in our minds, in our mentality, we think that God is just for me, for myself, and I. Like, that, like I need God. Like, I need you. I need you just for me. And it's true. It's true. Each and every one of us in this room, whether you know it or not, have a desperate need for who Jesus is and who he desires to do in your life. But it's so much bigger than just you. It's so much bigger than just me. It's so much bigger than just us. You see, investing into the next generation, equipping them for the suffering that they will go through is a calling that we have as believers in this room who have most of us kids or grandchildren either in that room or somewhere in this world. But I love the ending of verse 2 where it says, uh, may God the Father of Christ and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. I normally don't go into a word study, but today we have to, to understand what it means to have the grace and the mercy and the peace of God in our lives. It's detrimental. It's so important in understanding how it is that God allows us to outdo and overcome any suffering that we might face in our lives. You see, Grace, grace is receiving what we don't deserve. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. We're gifted a relationship, not a separation. We're gifted salvation, not damnation. But grace is only available to you, to us in this room, once you jump back up to verse 1 and have placed your faith in Christ Jesus. You see, there are so many promises filled within the scriptures that are attaining and open to you so long as you say, God, I declare you as my Lord and Savior. So long as you say, God, I know you died on that cross. I know you rose from that cross, uh, from that grave. And I know you ascended and you reign at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And I know that to be true. Although I cannot see you, I sense your presence. Although I cannot see you, you've moved in my life. Although I cannot see you, your faithfulness has shown evidence in my life or in my family's life. Now, mercy. Mercy means not receiving what we do deserve. Again, mercy means not receiving what we do deserve. So there's a lot of tongue twist in the wording. You see, as sinful people, as people who are born to a sinful nature, as people that no matter how good the deed is, can never reach the perfection at the level in which Christ has redeemed righteous for us. And this is what I mean in mercy. We deserve, each and every one of us in this room, we all deserve an eternity separated from the glorious presence of our Creator whose name is holy and completely pure. But, but in that mercy, we're spared. We're spared by cross from the separation by the mercy given to us again by Jesus dying on that cross. You see, the, the, the pivotal point, the, the factor in which our entire faith stands on is Jesus. Without him, without the cross, without him dying, without him resurrecting, we don't have a chance. We don't stand an opportunity and not receiving eternity, eternity separated from God. But again, mercy it's a promise in Scripture. And how is it that we inherit promises from Scripture, that we're able to say, whoa, this is the life and living, powerful Word of God. How does it pertain to me? You see, the key to opening your Bible is first and foremost having a relationship and a faith in Christ. Then mercy is added on to you, just like it was added on to Timothy and just like it was added on to Paul. Now, the last word of verse 2, peace. Paul, again, is reminded of peace while in a dark prison. Peace is something... <laughs> A believer has, despite the circumstance, peace 
is something a believer has despite the situation. You see, true peace is given by God. The peace that, come from God, that comes from God, the Bible says, it's peace that will guard your heart and will guard your mind and gives what you need in order to come out victorious from those battles of persecution and of suffering that you'll endure in your walk with God. You need the peace of God that will guard your heart and that it will guard your mind. You see, the Bible is, again, this beautifully crafted, woven book that, that just adds and adds and expounds to the glory and greatness of God. It's almost as if one missing link is gone. You, you, you can't get the whole picture. That points all to Jesus. And again, as we, as we dissected grace and we dissected mercy and we dissected having peace and how that peace is given to us by God, the question I will repeatedly ask this morning is how much are you personally willing to suffer in your fellowship with Christ? Let's keep reading in verse 3. Encouragement to be faithful. Verse 3 says this. Timothy, I thank God for you and that the God I serve with a clear conscience just as just as my ancestors did night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. Again, in the middle of persecution, I'll probably put this up here. In the middle of persecution, in the middle of a cold and damp and dark imprisonment, Paul's thankful. See, he's thankful despite the situation. He has peace despite the situation. He is able to have peace of the promises as his, uh, as a, as a, in the fellowship of suffering in, for Christ, in, in, in wrestling with who Jesus is. Paul was filled with thankfulness because he purely served God. It says with a clear conscience, without the hiding, the hiding, or the secrecy of sin in his life, with a pure conscience, he was thankful. He was thankful in serving God. He was thankful for the situation he was in. He was thankful for who God was in his life. You see, for us in this room, if we desire to endure the suffering that comes with the fellowship of Christ, we also need that clear conscience, that clear conscience that there is no form of sin that habitually and consistently takes us out of whatever God's will for our life is. You see, when our conscience is tinted, when our walk is hindered, it's almost like we give the enemy the perfect opportunity to say, hey, I'm not, I'm not really reciting with God right now. Come and take me out. I'm not really submitting to God. Come and do your work. You see, I love the way God has built this church. I love the demographic of Novo. I love the people that come here. I love you guys because for most of the people that I've come to know over the four years serving here, each and every one of the men that I've come to know has a warrior's mentality. That I will not lose, that I will not let my family be taken out by the enemy, that I will stand as a pillar of truth for my God, for my walk with him, and for everyone under my household. And that's done with the clear conscience. Because it's hard to lead a home when your house, when your heart is full of sin. It's hard to overcome the, the, the fellowship of suffering, the persecution you'll face as a believer when you've lost that joy of God because of the sin in your life. Paul looked beyond the walls of the dungeon and beyond his own circumstance and was reminded of the people God had placed in his life to join with him in the fellowship of suffering. He rejoiced in knowing that there was other believers out there on the same journey as he was supporting him, praying for him, interceding for him during his seasons of persecution. And he didn't rejoice 
because of his persecution. He rejoiced because his persecution gave people a reason to say, God, I have a brother who is going through something right now. Please be there with him. He rejoiced because it gave other people the opportunity to say, God, I know that you can move. That's why I'm going to cry out to you. That's why I'm going to pray out to you. That's why by my actions, I will represent that you are real and that you are true. Verse 5, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Unis, and I know the same faith continues strong in you. You see, the, the reason this was such... It was a weird week. It was a weird week from last week and what took place and, and how God allowed that privilege and, and just the text and the encouragements I've had and, and, and just knowing that God has a calling on, on my personal life as he does in your guys' life. But this verse, as I was, I was wrestling through the scripture, it really brought me to this place. A few sections in the scripture actually brought me to this place because this, this faith that Paul is talking about, his mother and his grandmother, reminded me of my own mother. You see, I can't tell you how many times I know my mom has prayed for me. How many times I've known she's prayed for my siblings and I. Like there's times when I doubted God's calling on my life and my mom stood there as a pillar in my life because of her faith with God and said, son, there's a calling on your life. There's a gifting that he has given you and go do what God has called you to do despite the circumstance. So the role that you have as a mother, as a grandmother, as a father in the room, how are you standing there in the gap and saying, I will raise up my kids to have the foundation to be able to withstand anything that the enemy throws at them. You see, we don't serve a fake and fable and foolish God. We serve a God who is real, who is tangible, and who desires to know you. So why do we show them a relationship that is so fake? Why do we show them a relationship that is so fable? Look, by our actions, myself included, we should say, God, I desire for you to move in my life. I desire for you to move in my wife's life. I desire for you to move through our marriage so that when we have kids, they are, you're, you, we have this opportunity. We've created this atmosphere where you can move in their lives. We've created a foundation in their life where they're able to stand on the pillar of life being you, Jesus, and declare your name more mightily than I could ever declare your name. You see, our desire as a church, my desire personally, and I've shared this with the youth, I wrestled it from time to time with the selfishness I have, is that every youth in that room is more equipped and more gifted and more able to declare and share the glory of God than any of us in this room could ever have. If we're not investing into preparing the grounds for our youth so that they have the foundation to outlast any suffering, any temptation, any persecution, and that when they do fall, we pick them up and say, hey, remember, God has his grace, his mercy, and his peace over your life. Have you, my son, have you, my daughter, have you, my grandchild, have you, my granddaughter, confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. You see, and it's not just a conversation you share with them. It's a conversation you share with them through the way you personally live your life. You see, for each and every one of you in this room, if you call yourself a believer, if you say that God has come inside me, transformed me from the inside out, dwells inside my heart, you should be a safe place for your children, for your grandchildren, and for whoever it is that just draws close to you. You should be a, a what are their names? They're an Unis and a Lewis in someone's life. And saying, hey, because of the faith that you had, so has God given the same faith to your future generations. The fellowship of suffering that you experience in your walk with God, again, is what God can use to draw your very children 
to himself. That's crazy to me. That's crazy to me that we can partner up with the movement of God and say, God, use me as a vessel in whatever capacity to declare your name. But in this, you have to ask yourself, what is the calling that God has over your life, over you personally? Sitting in those chairs, what is the calling, the reason and why God allowed you to exist in such a time of this, to exist with the opportunity to declare him as your Lord and Savior and endure the suffering that comes from the joy of knowing the Lord? You see, it is better to suffer for the name of God. It is better to suffer for the name of Christ than for your own name. Because guess what? We all come to the final realization. And two things, two things are the outcome. Either you died and suffered for yourself and the coolest thing you can get is some really cool comment on a tombstone. Or it's eternity with God. Or it's eternity in the presence of God. Or it's eternity in the legacy of a life lived for God. Let's continue in verse 6. Paul adds a reminder. This is why I rem remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God has given you when I laid my hands on you. You see, res flat, fat, oh my goodness. You see, flat, oh my goodness. What? <laughs> I, believe it or not, English was always a terrible language at first for me. Uh, but fanning into flames. Fanning into flames requires an action. It requires an action from you in your walk with God. It, if fanning your flame is essential in, in outlasting and enduring the suffering of Christ. Now, Timothy's role in this section of Scripture was to connect to that source, Connect to that source that increased the flame, that increased the desire within, within him to serve God. I was going to add an illustration, but as I'm teaching, I think it's kind of corny, so I'm not. But, yeah, I'm going to do it. it. It's no different than this. Just to put a picture, and, and, and my wife, it, it's always awesome studying a sermon when my wife is there, because she's like, okay, just, just explain this a little more, and it, it'll be good. I'm like, okay, babe, okay, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And so she, she was like, you have to add, like, what fanning into flame looks like. And, and the way that I could just come up with the picture it, it is a fire, right? There's a fire, and when you expose that fire, if it's enclosed, and you expose that fire to oxygen, it, it, it what? It just grows. It, it, it bursts. It, it, it robust, I think, is the word. Right? It's the same way. The flame, the fire, the spirit of God that dwells fully inside of you, that's the fanning the flame that Paul is talking about. That's what equips him and the gifts that God has already created him with. But he has to connect to the source. You see, we fan into flames the absolute truth that when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that the full power radiating glory of God dwelled inside us and started transforming us from the very core, from the inside out. And when you say, God, I want to draw close to you. I want to know you. I want to, I want to just, I want more of you, God. I just want more of you. That's what Paul is talking about to Timothy. Grow in your desire to know God more. Grow in your desire to know and, 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 and relationally spend time with God. And that as a result, having communion with the connection and the source of all life, then the giftings that he created you with, for he is the designer of your body, will be enhanced, you can say. By this, <clears throat> by this, Timothy is being prepared by Paul for the suffering that he is going to endure, the suffering that he is going to go through in his ministry of proclaiming and preaching the word of God. And to add back to the last section of scripture we were just over, what is it that God has called you to suffer for? What is it that God has created you for? And how is it that you flam that flame? How is it that you fan that flame? How is it that you tap into the source? You see, just like Timothy, 
Just like Timothy is challenged, is exhortated by Paul to say, hey, fan into flames by knowing God, by knowing his word, by reading his word. By owning a Bible and saying, hey, within this book, although it's paper and ink, it's a live and powerful word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword. That holds power, that holds holds just the, the, the key to heaven, which is all pointing to Christ and his salvation. Let's continue in verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Not fear, nor timidity. Paul is reminding Timothy not to be afraid, nor timid, especially after fanning into flame the spiritual gifts that God has given them. It is no different for us here in this room. Like the reality is, I have different giftings than my wife has different giftings. You have different giftings in your spouse. From across the room, God created us each individually, uniquely with a set of gifts, the set of skills to be God with this, with my hands, with the spiritual gifts that you have given me, I will bring glory to your name. And Paul is reminding Timothy, hey, I didn't, the Lord did not give you a spirit of fear and of timidity, meaning, meaning now. What he did give you a spirit of is power and love and self-discipline. You see, again, this week, and as I was reading through this section of scripture, this was a second second verse that just, oh my goodness, I was studying and it almost made me cry. Because as a young man who who has the privilege and the, and, 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 the, the, great, the love that grace, oh my goodness, the grace that God has over me to be able to stand here, to be able to preach God's word, to be able to direct your youth on Wednesday nights, to be able to pour into them, to be able to focus on my first ministry, being my wife. There's a sense of fear and there is a sense of timidness that says, God, like, I know you have a calling on my life. I know you have a plan for my life, but it's just scary because I don't feel like I'm capable of doing what you've called me to do to the full extent of what you've called me to do. Like, maybe I can do a small part, God, but, but, but whatever, whatever you have, whatever you're stirring, whatever you're doing, God, I, I don't know if I have it all. And in wrestling through this section of scripture and in the suffering of Christ, I was reminded that I'm not called and you're not called and we're not called to have it all. We're called to to fan the flame. We're called to draw near to God and that in our weaknesses, he's made strong. That in our suffering, he is glorified. That through our endeavors, that through our, our shortcomings, his glory is radiating. And that's what I urge you with this morning. If you have a task at hand, a a, a mission at hand, whether you're a brand new father or a mother or or just started a new season of life and you feel like, I just can't do it. I don't know how. You see, when you submit and you follow God's will in your life, you move with his authority and his power. When you say, God, first and foremost, I want to know where you want me to be. I want to know who you want me to marry. I want to know what career you want me to go into. I want to know how you want me to raise my children. And you know where his will is by drawing close to him, by fanning into flame, by spending time in his word. And then you take a step. That step is empowered by Jesus because you're at the center of where he's called you to be. And that's where he says, don't be afraid. Don't be timid. Instead, remember that, I have, that the Lord has given you power through his name. When you move in his authority, when you move with him, who can stand against? Who can overcome? Who can take you out? I mean, I'm reminded of the section of scripture where it says, submit to God. Oh, draw near to me, says the Lord, and I will draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee. You see, that chain of events only takes place and you not being taken out by the enemy and you not being taken out by the suffering if you first submit to God. If you forget that step and you don't submit to God, he's not going to draw closer and closer to you. And then when the enemy does come attacking, whether it's your home, whether it's you personally through temptation or whatever it is, when you're faced with a decision of bringing glory to God or not, guess what you're going to do? Flat on your face each and every one of us, myself included. And so I urge you, in the fellowship of suffering, you need God. 
There, there is no doing it without God. There is no outlasting it without God. Let's go into verse eight. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either. Even though I'm in prison for him, with the strength God, has give, God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. In uh, studying this section of scripture, in this verse specifically, I almost titled the sermon, Unashamed Suffering. Because Paul is just pointing out, hey, don't be unashamed to suffer for the name of God. Don't be unashamed to suffer for me as well, as a representative of God. Just don't be ashamed, because there is no shame in being correlated with the creator of the universe. There is no shame with being correlated with the God who flung every star into its place. There is no shame in suffering with the God who gives a radiating light to every star. I love that song, by the way. Man, every time it plays on the radio. That we worship and we serve and we suffer for a God whose glory gives radiating light to the stars. How great is our God? How powerful is our God? who spoke life into existence. Look, I know, and I know anyone in this room, there is no way we can speak life into existence, so why not get to the end of ourselves and say, hey, God, clearly you're way more and highly above by whatever I can imagine than I am. But let's be real. Let's be real with one another here in this room. 99.9% of us are not going to get shot, beheaded, or killed for our faith in Christ. If so, lucky you. Amen. And it sounds kind of rough, but I always wondered too, like, man, like, if I'm ever faced with that position, like, what would I do, you know? I'd be like, Psh, Jesus loves you. Um, there, my child just came out. It's out of the way. Um, it, it doesn't look that way for us. It doesn't look like a dark and damp dungeon Separated from God. Maybe in other places in the world in this very moment, yes. But with the luxuries that we have now, how does it look to suffer for Christ? How does the enemy, how, how do, what is the number one enemy attack in our lives constantly? It's relational. Each and every one of us here, it's relational. And, and it looks something like this. You'll suffer because of the hurt that the people of God cause you. You'll suffer because of the hurt your wife or your husband will cause you. You'll suffer because of the hurt your children or your parents will cause you. You'll hurt because you're hurt by the people who you've helped the most. Look, by human nature, by human nature and the existence of life, there will be a time when you're stabbed in the back. There will be a time when you feel betrayed. There will be a time when you feel just taken advantage of, you know, in whatever form that is. I don't want to flan, fly over it super gentle because obviously there is real hurt that people can cause other people. But in that wrestling, in that suffering, guess what it reminds us? It shoots us right back up. It shoots us right back up to verse 2. I pray that Lord and Christ Jesus will have grace, will give you grace, mercy, and peace. And in that, it reminds me of the Lord's Prayer. It says, like, Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And what that means is that every time that you are hurt, every time that you are offended, every time that you feel that someone has let you down and just completely lost your trust, guess what you're called to do? Have that grace, have that mercy, and have peace throughout the situation. But we miss the entire process of that if we don't draw close to God. Look, it's, to me it's crazy knowing that Jesus washed the disciples' feet, washed Judas' feet, knowing what he was about to do, knowing what, the role was, what, what his role was about to be. And still, the Most High God, the one and only God, 
took the form of the lowest servant in washing each of their feet and showed love and showed grace and showed mercy to Judas and the disciples. Again, I know I can't speak into life anything. I know I can't create anything just out of pure nothingness. I know I don't give the light. I know you don't give the light to any star. I know the power that you attain is nothing compared to the power that comes from knowing God, but yet he was merciless and graceful to show that to Judas. How much more are you able to do it as well? How much more are you able to use that suffering in your life to bring glory to God? Look, now it gets real because suffering isn't meant to be an easy task. Suffering isn't meant to be a walk in the park. We have it easy compared to scripture. We have it easy compared to different parts of the world. But hey, it's not meant to be easy because why? Because suffering and representing Christ and his grace and his mercy causes each and every one of us in this room to get to the end of ourselves and our pride and say, God, I want to represent you. I want to show your love. I want to do what you've called me to do. Now I know how you guys feel on Wednesday nights. For those of you that come Wednesday nights. I like the loud music blasting. It's okay. So. Let's go to verse 9. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. Again, but the person that caused suffering in my life doesn't deserve my forgiveness, doesn't deserve my grace, doesn't deserve my mercy. And again, to reiterate and to repeat, suffering and persecution and representing Christ isn't an easy task. Saying, hey, God, I want you to be more real in my life today than I, you were yesterday. I want to serve you. I want to know you more than I did yesterday morning. Lord, today, let it be a day that I use as a day to glorify you through my actions, through my vocabulary, through whatever it is. Just let me be an export of you. But again... In the wrestling of having to forgive someone that's hurt you, having to show grace, having to show love, having to represent Christ in the situation, I'll ask you again, how much are you personally willing to suffer in your fellowship with Christ? How much are you willing to represent God, although it's hard? Let's go to verse 10. And now he has made all of this plain to us. By the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior, he broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Guys, let's read that one more time. And now he has made all of this plain plain to us by appearing By the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior, he broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immorality through the good news. That's being written by a guy who is in a dungeon, who is persecuted, who is literally, like I said in the intro, moment, well, not moments, but close, very near to the moment where he knows he is going to die for his belief in Christ. Yet he says... That that death has lost its power and that it has been illuminated by who Christ is. You see, Paul was a man who didn't just speak. Paul wasn't a man who didn't just write. Paul was a man who experienced what God wanted him to write. And and, and by the grace and by the, the knowledge and by the ability that God allowed him to, he wrote these words. To remind not only Timothy, but to remind each and every one of us that through Christ, power, the power of death is gone. That through Christ, there is no power to death. 
that through Christ, death is now illuminated because for the believer in the room, again, it's just a movement from our bodies that are decaying, from our bodies that are breaking apart to a glorified body in the presence of God where we get to say over and over for the rest of eternity, holy, 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 holy is our Lord God Almighty. But again, how much are you willing to suffer in this fellowship with Christ? It's a privilege. Paul writes in Philippians 3.10, you don't have to flip there, it'll be on the screen, but you can write it on the margins of your Bible if you want. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. And then he says, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. You see, Paul was all in. He was all in because he wanted all of God. He was all in because he wanted all of Christ and his power and his authority to fulfill the life and purpose of Paul's life. So much so that he is faced with death and he is unfaced. So much so that he is threatened with death and he says, hey, over and over through scripture, look, for me, if I die this very moment, it's okay. It's actually better because I get to be in the presence of my God and you get to still be here. But look, when we desire God, we desire all of God. We don't just desire what, what comes with prosperity or we don't just desire what, what, whatever false teachings or, or excitement or, or just the joy that comes with the Lord. When we want God, we want all of God. And that means his suffering as well. That means his persecution as well. That means following in his footsteps. When we pick up our cross, count the cost and say, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. You follow him through every crevice, through every crack, and through every mountaintop. Because you say, God, you are worthy. You are worthy despite the circumstance. You are worthy despite the suffering. You are worthy despite whatever is taking place because your name is holy and holy alone it is. You see, to me, it's so crazy. It's so crazy that God allows us into the fellowship with him, into a relationship with him. It's so crazy to me that on Sunday mornings or whenever you're driving and you're listening to K-Wave or whatever Christian radio station you like to listen to, that you can sing out to God. Because not an ounce of our praise and our worships brings God's name even more glorious. What I mean by that is, is... God's name is already glorious. God's name is already powerful. And he is not dependent on our praise to be glorious, to be powerful, to be in control. But yet he allows us that privilege of saying, hey, I don't need your worship, but I'll allow you to worship me. I don't need you to acknowledge me, but I'll allow you to acknowledge me. As a matter of fact, I desire for you to acknowledge me so much so that I sent my son to die on the cross for you. And I was pleased by it, says the Lord. That's the God that we serve. He has absolutely, honestly no need for each and every one of us, yet he loves us and is willing to adopt us and graft us into his tree of life. Guys, I'm telling you, and I've said it before, you can't leave, you can't live your life without coming to knowing and to the relationship and to the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. I tell the youth all the time, and, 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 and it's, it, it speaks truth every time. Four years ago, the Lord got a hold of me here in this room. Four years ago, a guy named Grant was teaching, and I felt the Spirit of God pouring into me. And four years ago, I stood up and I said, God, I declare you, I want you in my life. And it took about three months for me to actually take it serious. And from that moment, I tell the youth, why not now at 14 or whatever age you guys are in this room, why not now it's not to let you still have breath in your lungs to say, God, I want you to use whatever life I have left. And you can look for the youth, I tell them all the time, you can look at your life when you're my age or you're your parents' age and say, man, Lord, for the last 30 years of my life, I've been able to bring glory and praise and honor to your name. Amen. Man, that's still crazy to me. Let's read the last two verses. And God chose me to be a preacher, verse 11 says, and an apostle and a teacher of this good news. That is why I am suffering here in prison. But I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one whom I trust. And I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. 
look, upon you, who God had called them to be, do you? Do you know who God has called you to be? See, Paul, upon you that God had called them into a fellowship of suffering. Do you know that it is the same calling on your life here this morning? That he calls you into a life, not only in his glory, but in a fellowship of suffering for him. Like I mentioned before, Paul knows he's coming near to his death. As the clock is ticking away, as he sits there writing this letter to Timothy, he knows his death is inevitable, but yet he trusts God in whatever the outcome is. He trusts God, and in Romans 8.18, he says this, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Yet what we go through in this lifetime, yet the hurt we go through, yet the suffering we endure, yet the, whatever it is under the umbrella of how hurt you've been or how much you've been betrayed, or, or, or I, I know there's real hurt. I'm not trying to fan over that. I'm not trying to say there has no real hurt. There is. There is actual evil hurt that other, a, a man or a woman can invoke on another man or a woman. But what this scripture reminds us and gives us joy of is that, hey, all this suffering... It's nothing. It's nothing compared to what I have for you, to what I have in store for you later in eternity in my presence. I've always wondered in scripture when it says, hey, in heaven there will be no sorrow or sadness. And I'm like, whoa, man, like, do I not remember my life? Do I, like, I not remember the, the press, my family member who's not there with me? Do I not remember this? Do I not remember that? How could there be no sadness or fear or sadness in heaven and the reason that there is no sadness and fear in heaven is because when you're in the presence of God it outdoes any emotion when you're in the presence of God it overcomes any feeling when you're in the presence of God there is nothing that your mind can focus on other than who the creator of the universe is think about it on a Wednesday night here we were worshiping we were, we're I've been wrestling with the youth and what it means to worship and how their posture position and how raising their hands or getting on their knees or even sitting in their chairs the matter is is how they surrender to God in worship and I told them why why do we take worship seriously? And a young man asked me, answered that question, and he said, hey, we take worship seriously because of Christ, if the creator of life, if the designer of every inch of our bodies, the one who knit us in our mother's room was standing here in this place right now, we would have no ability but to fall flat on our face and say, holy and holy is your name alone, God. And that's what I urge you. As we close in this last worship song, as the worship team comes up, wrestle with who God is. Wrestle with the calling that he has on your life. Wrestle with the hurt and with the suffering he has called upon you. And here's the challenge. Here's the charge. How does it look like for us leaving this room? How does it look like for us leaving these two doors and responding to this section of scripture? It means dying to our pride and before the sun sets today, try in some sort of way to set peace with whoever you've hurt or who's ever hurt you. Because, man, then it gets real. If you want to know how powerful God's word is, read it, hear it, understand it, and then do it. Amen. And I promise that word will come more alive to you than anything has ever come alive to you. It will come more alive to you than you feel alive. And so let's pray. And as we pray, as a worship team starts strumming their instruments, that's my wife. I urge you. No matter if you're, I don't know, who's my youngest in the room? 13. Or if you're the oldest in the room. And you sit here in this room and you sit here on these chairs as this worship song goes. Don't leave without the desperate knowledge and understanding and, and, and knowing that Christ has died on the cross for you, knowing that God created you, knowing that God designed you, and knowing that God draws himself to you, and all he says is, hey, son, hey, daughter, I'm right here. I've extended my hand. The gift is yours. All you have to do is acknowledge me as your Lord and Savior. Confess me as your Lord and Savior. Declare me with your tongue. Bow a knee and say, God, you did die on the cross for me. And then that's just the start of it. So let's pray.
God, I thank you again for what you're doing here in this place. I thank you for each and every one of us here in this room, Lord, that you allowed us to wrestle and go through your section of scripture, Lord. I pray for anyone in this room who is hurting, who is suffering, who is in the midst of a persecution for knowing you, God. Lord, I pray that whatever thoughts are roaming in the minds of your people here in this room tonight, Lord, whether it's anger towards someone else, whether it's hurt from someone else, God, that you allow them to move in action again with your word empowering them, God, with your spirit equipping them, with your gifts being fanned, fanned into flame in their lives, God. Lord, I pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit here in this place. I pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in these people's lives as they go home, as they live their lives, God. I pray Lord, that you allow them to draw closer and closer to you, closer and closer to your word, Lord, and that you transform them from the very core, from the inside out, God. So again, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege and the honor of even being able to speak the name of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, God. Amen.